Uh, well, a warm welcome to this uh, FENS um, uh, Winter School on Navigation and the Neural Basis of Navigation. Um, it's fantastic that you've all made it. I think you've all made it. I'm not entirely 100% sure if you're all here yet, but um, if uh, you got here at 3.30 in the morning and you're here now, you're heroes. <laughs> that includes you, Henrik. <laughs> um, and we'll present, we, we presented ourselves last night, the ones of us who were here, um, and those of, who, of you who weren't here uh, will have a chance to do that tonight when we gather around uh, and talk about project work, etc. So we'll, we'll make a, a small repeat for you guys as well. Um, and those of you who haven't met me before um, because you weren't here last night, uh, my name is Eric Warren and I'm one of the three people who have helped to organise the course. Uh, with Matilda, of course, as the main person actually doing all of the hard work administration. Uh, and it's my privilege to actually give the first lecture of the course, which is a very general lecture um, on the sensory cues used by navigating animals. Um, so what sensory cues are available in the environment, which animals can use to navigate. And I realise all of you come from extremely different backgrounds, both in terms of your university educations and in terms of the topics you're now doing your research on. So this is a very, very broad um, lecture where I deal with different types of animals, different types of scenarios for navigation. Uh, and it's not a deep lecture, but it's a broad one. The depth will come in the coming lectures in the course. And I'll occasionally sort of point forwards to um, uh, lectures that will, will come. Those of you who came in at like three o'clock in the morning, if you fall asleep in your chairs, I have absolutely no problem with that. So <laughs> fear not that I'm going to, uh, well, except for you, Henrik. I won't make any examples of any of you except Henrik Maritzen. <laughs> no, I won't. I won't pick on you, Henrik, I promise. Um, okay, so um, this is going to be, oh, I, I can't really predict immediately how long this will take, but uh, we have an hour and a half allotted for this, but I'm hoping that we can spend a fair bit of that time talking and at the end, and even during. So if you've got questions, of course, please just throw your hands up. I can't guarantee I'll be able to answer them, but I think between a lot of us, we will be able to find answers to most questions because I'm by no means an expert on every topic I'm about to tell you about now. Not at all, um, because of the breadth of this, of this particular lecture. So please uh, do stop me if there's anything unclear or if you've got a question about something, and hopefully we, we can sort it out. Uh, and we'll see how we go in the middle. If it's, it's, if it's looking like we need to take a break because people are uh, too tired um, to go for the whole length of time, then we can do that as well. So completely informal, in other words. Right, so one can start maybe by asking a really simple question, which is a perfect question for the start of a course like this, and that is, why would animals bother to navigate at all? What kinds of reasons would animals need to navigate? And you might have various reasons, and this is just a tiny number of possible reasons. These are just a few that I could think of, and you could probably think of a whole pile more. But for instance, you might want to navigate away from a situation um, to escape competition or predators or to find food. So your navigational tasks might involve foraging, for instance, very common uh, uh, thing in, in to, to, nav to use navigation for. You might use navigation to find your way back home after a long trip away from home. Um, you might use navigation to find mates in other locations. You might also um, use navigation to find favourable environmental conditions or to escape unfavourable ones. For instance, if you're a long distance migratory um, animal, uh, you go to places a long way away where things are better for you in terms of food or whatever, weather possibly. Um, okay, if I can get this to, oops, wrong button. So, and then you might say, well, okay, if these are the kinds of reasons for navigating, um, how would you go about doing this? What kinds of mechanisms would you use to pursue a navigational goal? And for this, I think um, Stanley has written a very nice review that hopefully you've all read uh, that details some of these principles in very good detail. So I'm going to be sort of uh, using and abusing his nice piece of work and several others in this room as well to, ex to explain this business with navigation. But basically, the um, way to pursue a navigational goal is effectively if you're navigating somewhere and you have a particular goal and you have to go somewhere, uh, you're returning home for instance or you're travelling to a far distant place on the planet when you're migrating, 
then when you're navigating, you're generally trying to compare your current heading, whichever way you're actually traveling, with, in, in terms of body orientation, for instance, with a desired heading. In other words, the location of a particular goal that you're, you're looking for, whether that be home or, or a distant location if you're migrating, for instance. And then you're continuously attempting to try and um, remove any mismatch between those two things, your desired goal and your current heading, by actually generating some kind of compensatory commands. And of course, this is where the nervous system comes in, and this is going to be a very large part of this course, talking about this compensatory steering behavior. And many other things too, of course, to do with navigation. And what is overwhelmingly um, known now today is that in order to navigate, animals require sensory cues of various kinds. And that makes no difference whether we're talking about a very small invertebrate, um, even the smallest imaginable animals that you can, can think of, to multicellular organisms like migrating birds or even, even mammals. All of these organisms require some kind of sensory cue in order to be able to navigate. And to do that, they need to be able to reliably sense those cues. So well-functioning sensory organs, of course, are essential for this. And all the sensors, it turns out, that we know of are used in one way or another in one group of animals or another for navigation. And there are essentially sort of three main categories of navigational strategies that animals use. There are simple short range sort of straight line orientation strategies and these are typically sort of escape reflexes which may involve just going reflexively in a random direction. Those are typically very short distance, I'm, and I've taken the liberty to, to actually add distances here, but in fact these are very, very loose, these, these uh, ranges of distances, and they have more to do with body size rather than actual physical numbers of metres or kilometres. So these are sort of ranges relative to body size that, that are more important. But if we're talking about a sort of a, a standard sort of animal that's in the vicinity of anywhere between 100 grams and a kilogram, then these are reasonably okay ranges to be talking about. So that, that's the first navigational strategy, short range, almost reflexive like straight line orientation um, navigational tasks. And uh, we'll hear a lot about those in this course, um, particularly in the lecture that Marie, Marie Ducker will, will give you on dung beetles. Then we have medium range navigational tasks, which are things like homing, and as I'll tell you about in a moment, path integration, mechanisms by which animals are able to, for instance, find that a specific goal like their nest or some kind of home after a foraging trip within their territory, for instance. And then we have also long range navigational strategies. And these are um, my, uh, navigational strategies which involve movements of animals over enormous distances, up to tens of thousands of kilometers. And we're all aware of nocturnally migrating birds. We also have sea turtles, fish, insects, many animals migrate over tremendous distances. And these tend to be long range navigational tasks that they're undertaking. Yeah. Does this division also reflect the kind of cues the, the animals use or not? It can do, it does, and I'll talk about those now, actually, well, during this lecture, but absolutely, they're, they're uh, different types of cues, they're used in different types of navigational strategies, but what's very important, and I'll reiterate this many times, is that no single sensory cue is, is um, used at the expense of others. Animals have evolved to use every damn thing they can get their hands on to make sure that they do the task right. Otherwise they die, <laughs> simple as that. So there's no such thing as kind of sensory ex exclusivity here. I mean, it's really a case of animals using everything that they've evolved to use in order to navigate. So just as an example, I'm just gonna give a few little kind of examples here. And many of these things I'm gonna tell you about now are going to be gone into in depth during this course in various lectures. Uh, and where I can remember, <laughs> I'll try and just point out who those people will likely be that will talk about those things in the coming days. So the first one of this, uh, one of the, the first of these strategies, short range straight line orientation, um, is something that Marie um, Ducky will tell you much more about with regards to dung beetles. Uh, but just to give you a little taste of this, I've just got a little film of um, a, a dung beetle starting to roll a ball. This is work that I've actually been involved in in the past. Maria and I are very, very dear friends and we've been working on dung beetles for a very long time. Um, and uh, Marie is the, the person who is uh, in totally doing this project. I've, I've moved away from it now. But 
Uh, I've spent a lot of happy times in South Africa doing this project with Marie. And here is a, an example of uh, what this straight line sort of orientation is about. So you have a, a dung beetle, this is all sped up a little bit, rolling a ball of dung at a dung pile in Africa. And this is seen from above, and this is the rolling tracks of these beetles as they move outwards. And they're reasonably straight. Some of them less straight than others. Actually, these are rather probably poorer examples of tracks compared to what, what they're in fact capable of. Um, but over time, they move away in extremely straight lines. The reason they do this is to get away from the fury of the dung pile, where there is enormous competition for this very rare resource, and there are other beetles that will happily steal the products of your labour if you're not careful. In other words, if you roll a ball, it's not entirely unlikely that you'll lose it because some other beetle will steal it from you. So you have to get away from here as fast as possible. And straight line, a straight line orientation in any direction um, will do that for you. But as I say, Marie will spend a lot more time telling you about that in, and the sensory cues used for this task uh, in the coming days. So here's just, a, again, some actual experimental tracks of beetles seen above, from above in the same way as you saw in the film as they move away in these straight lines uh, from the dung pile. But that's all I wanted to say about that. Marie will tell you much more uh, in her lecture. So if we talk now about medium range navigation and homing and path integration, some of you may not have heard of path integration. Uh, some of you may have. Um, and you'll probably hear a lot more about that in the course, but I'll just sort of introduce the main concepts uh, here in this lecture. Homing is very well known to people who um, uh, know about homing pigeons because their, their name even suggests the task that they're performing. But homing pigeons uh, are very well known to be able to leave their roosts and fly large distances and come back again to their roosts uh, very accurately over very large distances sometimes. I think some competition um, birds have been tracked going up to 1,800 kilometres return. Uh, and I'm sure Anna, you would have much more experience of these types of figures than I do. Um, but they have, they're phenomenal homers, and they use, obviously, a, a great number of different kinds of sensory cues for this task. And Anna will tell you a lot more about that um, in the future, uh, in about two days from now, in fact. Insects, too, are uh, well-known path integrators. Uh, Carl von Frisch, the great Austrian uh, zoologist who won the Nobel Prize for this and other types of work in 1973, it was the first person to describe how uh, honeybees communicate the location of a foraging site to nest mates in the nest by basically using mechanisms of path integration. So they would dance, they dance inside the hive uh, at an angle relative to vertical, which indicates the location of the sun relative to, the, to, to north, and the length of time that they dance in the nest uh, indicates the distance. So the kind of vector direction and distance, if you like, is communicated to nest mates in this way. Uh, it's a very well-known story. I'm sure you're all, all aware of it. And then, of course, we have a very famous path integrator that's been worked on for many decades, the desert ant Cataglyphus bicolor. Many of you sitting in the room actually do use this species as part of your PhD project. But they, too, are tremendous path integrators. And basically, path integration is all about being able to calculate a return vector uh, to home, um, having gone out from a nest, as you see here on, on, on the slide, to, in this case, uh, this is an experimental situation, but there's a, a feeder. Do we have a, a pointer in here, actually? Yeah, so you have a, a classic example of uh, these ants are able to make these enormously tortuous outbound journeys looking for food in the hot desert in the middle of the day in North Africa. And when they find a morsel of food, they have to, under incredible pressure, get back to the nest as soon as possible because the temperatures just above the surface of the sand are incredibly high. So any time spent out in the, uh, on the desert surface is time likely to kill you in the end. So they've um, developed mechanisms to be able to return directly in a straight line path direct back to the nest. And experimentally, uh, Rudy Gavainer and his wife Sybil, in this case, actually did a, a displacement experiment to show how this works by picking up an ant precisely at the moment it found food, moving it to another point several metres away and releasing it, and seeing then what happens. So the ant follows this vector-like path back to where the nest should have been and of course doesn't find it because it's now in a new location. The ant makes this tortuous search routine to try and find the nest entrance before it, it's too late for the ant. Um, so this ability to calculate continuously the home vector um, on such a trip is, is, is the mechanism which is referred to as path integration. And these ants do this extremely well and so do many other animals. And we'll probably hear, I think, more about that during the course. 
Okay, so these are kinds of navigational mechanisms used in medium range navigation in homing. Then in terms of long range nav navigation, we're talking about migration of animals over enormous distances. And this long na distance navigation um, takes place in several phases normally. So there's usually a long distance orientation phase which allows you to migrate in particular directions over long distances from the origin towards the goal. Okay, this is using, as we'll see later, uh, various types of compass cues to hold a specific direction from the origin towards the goal. Then when you're getting closer to the goal, you come to a kind of a narrowing in phase in this long distance <coughs> migratory behavior in which the animal is brought, when it is in, in the vicinity of the goal, then there are other sensory cues, very often landmarks of various kinds, which allow animals to home in on the final goal. And when they're very, very close to the goal, then there is a so-called third pinpointing phase, which allows the animal to actually get to the goal. Again, various types of landmarks. They may not be the same landmarks as used in the second phase, but ultimately over this very, very long journey, you have three major phases, all of which involve different kinds of sensory cues used in series, one set after the other, after the other, as you home in on the goal. Um, and um, you'll hear about this a lot during this course. And of course, migratory birds, long distance migratory birds are a classic example of an animal that migrates over tremendous distances. And you'll hear plenty of talks during the course about these animals and how they do this. Uh, but tens of thousands of kilometers are typical for these animals to migrate. And if you look at a map of Europe, several different kinds of uh, origin locations for, these are a specific species of bird from uh, this paper here, tree veil at Montague's Harriers, where they've tracked birds um, leaving various parts of Europe and arriving in various parts of Africa. And as you see, the tracks are fairly straight and the, return migra the forward migration and the return migration are uh, very similar. So these animals have a tremendous ability to navigate extremely accurately using these sensory cues, which I'm going to tell you more about in just a moment. Okay? And again, here you would find these three phases of migratory behaviour evident. Um, the sort of long distance sort of compass directed migration towards the, the goal and then the, uh, the other two phases involving um, coming closer to the goal and then pinpointing the goal. The same is true for sea turtles which have been tracked with special types of, of so-called satellite tags which you can uh, clip to the fins of, of, of sea turtles and then track them over long periods of time. Yeah? Could you go one slide yeah, of course. Right side, the green ones, some of them have the central migrating route and others have the eastern migrating, mm. migration route. So is it known what are the, the triggers that decide which route the, the birds are taking? That's a very good question and I must admit I'm not an expert on this topic, but there are several who are sitting in the room that would be better to answer that. Can you guys answer that question? Well, I would say that it's a combination of inherited program and social interactions. and. Uh, Birds do have an uh, inherited program, and it may differ in different parts uh, of the um, of the range. I mean, different populations, but they, but at least diurnal migrants, at least birds that migrate by soaring flight during the daytime, they do watch other guys, and social interactions also play a role. And I could add that this is a hen, hen hair or something, or Montagu's hair, yeah. which is uh, a pretty good active flyer. If you would have made the same graph for something like uh, spotted eagle or lesser spotted eagle, you would have had strong concentrations over Bosporus and over Gibraltar. But this bird can actually migrate day and night and, and can actively fly. This is not a soaring. It can soar, but it's not a primarily soaring flight bird of prey. Thanks. Yes, and sea turtles, as I said, that can be tracked also with uh, various types of tags, satellite tags in this particular case, quite expensive things, uh, that eventually sort of corrode off the fin of the turtle and float to the surface where the data is downloaded onto a satellite. And again, the same kind of thing you, you see here is that these animals are able to navigate over huge diff distances and, and can often do so with rather straight trajectories. And what I forgot to mention is that both birds and sea turtles are capable of migrating, uh, navigating during migration to very, very specific locations. The same location within meters often 
one, from one year to the next and repeat that. So these are pinpoint accurate navigational tasks which don't rely on GPS, uh, they just rely on sensory information available in the natural world. And this is a fantastic feat, actually. And both insects uh, that we know of and also uh, vertebrates are capable of this. Oop, yep, sorry. Sorry, um, maybe it's a very obvious question, but uh, is there any reason why it's only female turtles in that case? <sighs> now that's a good question, too. <laughs> um, Henrik. My guess is they were easy to get because they go on land and lay eggs. <laughs> so you can get them and put a tag on them. Yeah, <laughs> the males possibly are doing the this. The males cannot come and lay eggs, so yeah. where would you catch them? So yeah. I think yeah. that's a very, very simple, uh, mm. practical explanation. Mm. And of course it's more interesting to study female if you want to study homing because they have a drive to come back to lay egg in a specific place, whereas the males, you know, Maybe any lady would be okay yeah. anywhere, so it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to go back to the same place. Yes, and as I say, insects are also capable of this type of pinpoint accuracy with, when, it, when it comes to navigational tasks. And monarch butterflies, for instance, um, which are a well-known uh, day-active navigator, they originate from various parts of uh, northern United States, southern Canada, and very large proportion of those butterflies migrate to very specific location in Mexico um, where they spend uh, some months before returning again to the original site. So this is a very, very accurate um, and very small region that they all head to, despite the fact that they come from quite a large catchment area of origins. They all head to this very specific location. Uh, so this is also a very interesting navigational task that people have studied for a long time. Um, I myself work on this particular animal, it's like a, a, a nocturnal version of the monarch butterfly. They too also migrate um, from a large catchment area of, of, of breeding areas in southeastern Australia and all of them head to our highest mountains in Australia, a small uh, high alpine area where there are small caves which they all um, aggregate in over a few months before, again, after the summer is over, they do this during summer, they then return to their breeding areas to mate, lay their eggs and then die. Um, and this is also an extraordinarily tiny region of the world where they all go to. Um, and in that sense, they're very similar to the monarch butterfly and many migrating birds and, and sea turtles. In fact, the monarch butterfly and the bogong moth are the only known examples that we have so far of insects that are capable of this pinpoint precision in navigation. Uh, there are probably others, but we're just not aware of what they are at the moment. Because most, most other types of insects that migrate often do so between one broad region to, um, to another in order to follow favourable conditions. But not the case of in, the in the case of the monarch of the Bogong moth. So that was just a kind of a, a very quick and, and rather <laughs> shallow introduction to the... Yes? We don't know that yet, but it makes no sense for them to do otherwise, because in the case of the bogong moth, for instance, the actual compass direction must be genetically encoded. So if they arrive from one location and then return to some other location and then breed when they get there with other individuals who have done exactly the same thing, then the, mag the directional compass will be wiped out, the genetic basis of it at least. Yeah, so they need to know. They need to know how to get back again but too. Also These are all unanswered questions that we're working on. So they're really good questions, but they've got no answers. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wish they did. Yeah. I can answer for the monarch. I mean, I actually doubt that the monarch has that. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you look at uh, tagging recovery, so you tag uh, monarchs, there are lots of monarchs tagging in North America. It's a hobby. Yeah. And then if you look at where, how they distribute, if you, if you take all tagging locations, you, you displace them to one central location, mm -hmm. uh, and then you look at the, uh, the, the uh, distribution. Yeah, the, the circular distributions, they are very, very bad at going in the migratory direction. Oh. So they spread out a lot, and it looks like in the monarch butterfly that they are actually only 
getting there because of the natural funneling effect. They had the Rocky Mountains on one side and the Gulf of Mexico on the other side. Yeah, I was wondering about this because you have a funnel between yes. mountains and you have the seaside. And yes. if you follow that, you end up in Mexico. Yeah, <laughs> and, and where they overwinter is the first perpendicular mountain range. Uh -huh. So that all makes sense. What we don't understand, there's still a question, how do they do the, the last two, three hundred kilometers? That's completely unknown <coughs> at the moment, I think. Yeah. But when they go back, Again, the, the, considering how bad they are going in the migratory direction, if we can trust the, the, the tanker covers, they would naturally spread out all over North America, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. east, of, east of the Rockies. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually doubt that the monarch is able to do that, but the Bogon laws must, because there is no clear leading lines leading to the Bogon location. So that's a bit strange. But well, there is one, and we can't rule this out yet, and that is that the moths could all basically go eastwards until they hit the main mountain range going along the east coast of Australia and then travel southwards. That's not impossible, actually. No, we, we, we have to solve that issue. Yeah. Just to add one thing to the minor butterfly, so the kind of whole thing is a multi-generational endeavor, right? So there's no single monarch that does the whole uh, there and return migration. So the return trip is at least two or three uh, generations. And so then there's maybe two or three non the migratory generations, and then finally, you know, then it goes back, um, like on the migratory right? So that is the whole trip takes like five to seven generations of animals. So that's a very big difference actually from the uh, from the bulk of There's probably everything in one generation. So everything is in one generation, definitely. Yeah, the forward and the reverse trip is made by the same individual. Yes, Paulina. Yeah, you know, I wanted to say the same yeah. thing that it's important to note that the butterflies are not going back and forth. Um, but that there are more generations. Mm. Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So I was going back to the, the Bogon moths. Um, so we, do we know if they're panmictic or they, they, they do go to different caves? We're There's working on that right now. There's, we've got early indications that individual caves are occupied by moths from individual origins, which makes the task even more interesting. Yeah, but this is really, really rudimentary early data, and I don't want to say that we've found that this is the case. It's just an indication so far, a very weak one, admittedly too. Yes, Anna. Yeah, I would like to. I didn't want to interrupt you before when you talked about homing pigeons, yeah, but sure. I need to. I I need to uh, make a comment on the fact that pigeons home from 1,800 kilometers because those pigeons are uh, unidirectionally trained by fanciers. So oh, okay. uh, if you take a pigeon, then you r raise it as a free flyer, and then you take it straight to 1,800 uh, 1, kilometers, never come back. All oh, right. So <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so th those pigeons are, uh, I don't know whether they can r really navigate uh, at those distances, because they are unidirectionally trained. So if you take them in a different direction, and, and then uh, they, you know, they just have the habit to go in that direction and maybe they realize that they, they are in the wrong direction eventually. But at the beginning, they just go in that direction. So mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't even call it navigation. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I think, I think uh, and it shows motivation because what, you know, what, I think that what homie pigeons were selected for for uh, yeah. hundreds of years or two, a couple of thousand years, is a motivation to uh, to go home because uh, you know so we we have some studies of uh, of homing in bats. So in fact, if you look at the short distances, a few tens of kilometers, they're as straight as, as any homing pigeon. So I don't think there's a really a difference in uh, in capability to navigate all these distances. But if you <laughs> displace a bat with uh, these distances, you know, hundreds of kilometers. So why would he even <laughs> bother to go back? There's food everywhere, right? So it's, it's this issue of uh, to, to get a readout, behavioral readout on the navigation capability, you need to have a, a motivation for them to go back. So this a beautiful example of the, uh, the sea turtles, the female sea turtles, they have motivation or a trained uh, pigeon as a that's yeah, generally an issue of studying uh, navigation. I don't think it's only a matter of motivation, but it's also the, the size of the man. So beyond a certain distance, so they. They are unlikely. So I'm saying yeah. is that, is that yeah, in general, to study navigation, you really, your result is essential. That they, that there are bats in, uh, yeah. in Australia that don't, they kind of move erratically between trees. So 
we have no idea. Maybe that is fantastic navigation map for the entire area, but it just goes seemingly randomly. How are we going to measure it, right? So unless you have an animal to want to go back to the cave, or so, so it's a really bad issue. It's central and stuff that makes sense. Maybe one more question, we'll, we'll move on. Yeah, sorry, Anna. Yeah, it's also about the long-range navigation. So, yeah. so I was wondering, to which extent um, do you find uh, sort of choosing of opportunistic routes, for example, like if you see that there's variation in the routes, mm. maybe depending on the weather condition mm. or the sea currents, that they will choose a different route. That I'm sure that happens all the time. I'm sure that's actually true. Yeah, but they must correct at some point. To, to find their final goal, but yeah, absolutely along the route. It, I mean, you even saw from those tracks actually from the the birds just how I mean they're not exactly straight lines. I mean they're they're quite quite variable, and that could be because they're following specific landmarks. <coughs> could be because they're avoiding storms. I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, again, you you Henrik would probably know more about this than the uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, as well. That's of course very very difficult to prove one way or another because. It's difficult to do an experiment with that, but the, tr the, the tracks, obviously, I would agree, they don't look straight enough to mm. be just compass. But as, mm. as usual, usually biology is not just anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of different things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how often you get like a strange weather phenomenon that makes a certain route that's popular really unfavorable. And yeah, and it's again. also very difficult because I mean, that would depend. Uh, do you, you don't know for every species what their strategy is and, and mm -hmm. the ecology of the different species <coughs> can be different. So even if you study five different species, you'll get five different answers. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are 5,000 examples of this bird navigation that people have been fighting about whether this is the right answer, this is the right <laughs> answer, this is the right answer, and the thing is they are all right to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the situation, it depends on the ecology of the animal, it depends on all kinds of things. And, and it's very, very difficult to start with, study with that specificity because it's ecology. That you cannot control all these different parameters <coughs> in your experiment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on then to the kinds of sensory cues that might get used in navigation. Um, and as I say, I'm gonna, you'll hear this over and over again. The, the reality is no single sensory cue is ever more or less, or it's very rarely at least used in isolation. Sensory cues uh, manifold. There are many different kinds of sensors, as we're well aware, and navigation usually relies on a suite of such cues from the diff different kinds of sensors. And exactly what combination of cues are used at any one moment during a navigational task can vary from one moment to the next, uh, and one circumstance to the next. In, one, in different stages of a, a long distance migration, for instance, uh, various cues are used in different phases, and, and, and even within a phase they will change too, depending on what's happening at the time in the environment, what the needs of the animal are at that moment, and so on and so forth. There are a number of different reasons for this. But um, you sometimes hear, unfortunately, in the navigational literature, it makes, sometimes you read papers and you start to wonder whether this person actually thinks that only that cue that they work on is important at the expense of all others. But that's just simply not true, ever, really ever. <laughs> Never, evolution doesn't work like that. <laughs> Okay, and the kinds of cues that are used in navigation are of three main types, really. Um, there are global external cues which are found all over the planet, basically everywhere where you are, they are there. Then there are very specific cues that are also external, which are more specific to the world where you're most likely to find yourself. So these are often within a territory, so these are kind of local external cues. So and we're all aware of the ones that we have in our, our local environment normally is around where we live and we're well aware of the kinds of cues that we cue on to navigate around home, between home and university for instance and, and, and animal, other animals do this as well. Then of, there are the final class of cues are cues that arise within your own body as a result of navigation and which are used um, to help you to navigate and these are the so-called idiothetic or internal cues um, and we'll talk about those as well. These have been investigated in a number of different animals. By the way, um, I can turn this into a PDF and make it available to everybody. So uh, if you can't catch every little word on every slide, you'll get them anyway. So starting with the first kind, uh, the global external cues, what exactly are those? And I don't think what I've listed here is exhaustive either. You may come up with other ones as well. And I know there are other ones I haven't listed for the sake of brevity. But some of the mo most obvious ones are celestial bodies, like the sun, the stars, the moon. These celestial bodies, which are obviously visual, um, these are omnipresent uh, across the planet every single day and night. 
And not surprisingly, animals have evolved to use them as a compass. We ourselves do it. We we'll often take a direction um, according to the sun, maybe not even thinking about it, trying to hold the sun in a particular location when we walk. That's why many of us that traverse the planet and end up on the wrong side of the hemisphere from where one grew up, suddenly have the whole thing reversed and get very confused and lost. I did when I first moved to Sweden from Australia. Um, I had no idea how much I relied on the sun, what little there was in Sweden, but when it was present, um, uh, how often I got lost relying on the sun as a celestial compass cube. Um, but nonetheless, for those animals that use the sun, it's an incredibly constant, predictable and reliable cue, day in, day out. It comes up in the same place, it goes down in the same place, and more or less from day to day it crosses the same path across the sky at any one time of year. Um, and if you can see the, the sun and understand those properties that the sun, or the moon in this case possibly, although you'll see in a moment it's not as reliable, uh, if you can see these properties of the sun, you can potentially use them as a compass for navigation. The biggest problem you have, though, as a, a, a navigator that navigates, for instance, all day using the sun as a compass cue, is that, of course, the sun moves. It comes up in the east, it goes down in the west, and during the, the transition from, from, from dawn to dusk, the sun travels across the sky, it, uh, admittedly across a very predictable um, tra track, but nonetheless it changes. And if you want to keep a constant bearing, if, for instance, you want to fly south continuously all day, okay, you can't rely on just keeping a constant angle to the sun at every point during the day. Because if you do that, you'll end up flying in a curved course and you won't fly south. So you have to be able to know in advance in your head where the sun is going to be at different times of day and correct for that. And this process is referred to as time compensation. And many, many, many animals use this for navigating during the day. Everything from birds to insects. And in fact, a very famous example of an animal that uses a time compensated sun compass is the monarch butterfly. Uh, and Stanley Heinzer, who's sitting back here, has done some really, really beautiful work on the neurobiology of this sun compass in monarchs. And he may or may not tell you about that in his, his lecture, I'm not sure, but you can at least ask him about it. <laughs> yeah. The moon, in contrast, though very useful as a compass cue for many animals, is nowhere near as reliable. And the reason for that, of course, is that the moon is only up for half the month. Uh, so if it's present at all, um, uh, it's only up for maybe a short part of the night. Uh, when it is up, it's not necessarily the same shape. It changes its shape dramatically, therefore also its intensity. So it's nowhere near as constant and therefore nowhere near as reliable. Uh, it's very useful for, for short duration navigational task when nothing much happens uh, to the moon over the course of an evening. But for many nocturnally migrating animals that migrate all night, it's not a very good cue, actually. Not as good as the sun. Now, both the moon and the sun also produce another type of, of, of cue, which is very useful in navigation, and that is polarised light. And you probably all have heard of polarised light at some point in your education. But basically, polarised light arises from the scattering of unpolarised sunlight. Okay? And basically, all polarised light is, is the fact that there are particles in the atmosphere which um, scatter incoming unpolarised light and in different directions. The light that's scattered in the perpendicular direction is plane polarised. That means that the electric field component, the electric field vector of light, which is, after all, sometimes referred to as electromagnetic radiation because it consists of an electric component and a magnetic component. The magnetic component is, is actually an, an electric wave and is sort of well represented by a wave that's travelling in a particular plane. And all of the rays of light within that, that all of those uh, rays of light which are being scattered perpendicularly all have their... Um, electric field vectors pointing in the same direction. In other words, the plane in which the electric field wave is oscillating, the plane for every ray of light is parallel to every other ray of light. And this is linearly polarised light. And in the dome of the sky, at every point in the sky, there is a particular direction of polarised light produced. In fact, it looks like this. So this can be the sun or the moon. The only difference between the two is that the pattern formed around the moon is a million times dimmer. But here you see, in this case, the sun. It's moving across its track during the day. And polarised light is produced at every location in the dome of the sky. So this is a kind of hemispherical dome of the sky with the sun in it. 
And at every point in the sky, you've got plain polarized light produced, which has an angle of polarization, which is equivalent to the angles of these lines. The thickness of these lines indicate the degree of polarization. In other words, how polarized in percent is the light at that point in the sky. And that varies too. But it's a circular symmetric pattern centered around the sun or the moon. And it has a symmetry plane, which is um, defined by the track of the sun here. And this light can act as a compass cue for all animals that can see it. And we can't see it. But most invertebrates can, and even some invertebrates now, are, sorry, some vertebrates now are claimed to be able to see it and use it for navigation. So it's like a big sort of stripe of light across the sky that you can orient yourself under and relative to, and therefore hold a straight line track. It moves, of course, with the sun. So from, from sun up to sun down, and here's an example of sun down over here, uh, the pattern of light is very um, simple indeed. So that's, if that's west, or it could be east in the morning, then basically all of the polarized light in the sky is polarized in a direction parallel to north-south over the entire dome of the sky. Okay? And that's a very powerful compass cue for animals that are active at dusk and dawn, a very simple one too. Yeah? Yeah. Is there a minimum angle that the animal can discriminate, animals in general can discriminate? I mean, um, in, in the minimum sort of delta. That I have these two points on the sphere, it's yep. and I can use them to track my direction in some sense. If they are too close to each other, probably the sensory system cannot differentiate, right? Yes, that's, that's possibly true at the sort of single pair of detector levels. but. The um, animals that use this for navigation integrate over the entire sky. So ultimately in the brain, you've got cells that are actually more or less have a receptive field and, and their internal receptive field properties are matched like a matched filter to the pattern in the sky. It's absolutely fantastic. This has actually been recently found in locusts um, in the uh, lab of Uwe Homburg. Um, and one of you, I think, is actually here from that lab. So he, there, there you are. I've got a poster on that topic. Oh, you've got a poster on that topic. Perfect. The, the answer is here already. Uh, OK, yes, and as, as I just said there, m most invertebrates can see this and use it as a compass. So cataglyphus again, bees, many different kinds of insects, and crustaceans too, for that matter use the polarized pattern of the sky for navigation as a compass. Yes, Lewis? Sorry, just a quick question about the previous slide. Do, yeah. we, do we know if animals can detect positional information as well from polarized light? Is it Not that I know of. OK. No. But the advantage usually, I mean, cited for this is A, even if the sun is below the horizon, Indeed. then yeah. you can use that. And or even in the rainforest, when everything is very confused, That's, you yep. can't really see where the sun is. But you see a small patch of blue sky <coughs> that gives you the direction towards the sun. So it, it's a bit it rely on very partial information where you cannot see the sun. That's right, yeah. And for the sake of brevity, I, I didn't mention that. But that's absolutely true. Narkom is right. So that one of the great advantages of this system is that on partly cloudy sky, when the sun is obscured, you can still infer the location of the sun from the light you see, even in a very small patch of sky, actually. Uh, and you can see it through a rainforest canopy. And I know our bees, nocturnal bees, I'll tell you about later, use this rainforest canopy patch polarized light, most likely for navigation. Then there's also another global cue is the uh, starry sky um, and the Milky Way, which is more prominent actually in the southern hemisphere than it is in the northern hemisphere. It's a very prominent bright stripe of light in the southern hemisphere. And just like the um, uh, polarization pattern, it too can be used by animals that can see it, and we also can see it, to orient under in order to um, take, uh, choose a particular direction to move in. Uh, but not only the broad stripe of the Milky Way, but also the constellations of stars themselves. And it's well known, for instance, that migratory birds also have a, a, a star compass in addition to, as we'll see in a moment, a magnetic compass for finding their direction. So the animals, and again, I'm, for the sake of brevity, I, have, I can't go into this in any detail. We know, for instance, that various types of nocturnal dung beetles are capable of using the Milky Way as a compass. Marie, no doubt, will tell you all about that in her lecture after later today, or after me. Uh, we also know that um, harbour seals are able to navigate using pattern of stars in the sky, and so too are many types of um, long, long distance migratory birds at night. Um, they all of these animals have time com compensated star compasses. They're time compensated because, of course, just like the sun, the stars also move across the sky at night 
due to the rotation of the Earth. So this is also another global queue. And if you're a beetle, for instance, looking at the Milky Way, that's what, you what we might see. Uh, and then seen through the uh, optics, it's a bit bright, unfortunately. It's not easy to see this. Most of my lectures are about vision in dim light. Yes? Uh, that with the bird. Yeah? Uh, I have to put in a protest. Sure. Protest away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the, the star compass of all these night migratory songbirds is not time compensated. Oh, it's not time compensated? No. It relies only, on, as I will tell in my very broad introductory lecture tomorrow, yeah. uh, it's only based on identifying the center of, right. of rotation. Yeah. It, there is no strong evidence. There has been a few claims, but... I think I've read the claims, Henrik, I fear. <laughs> uh, and uh, there is no clear evidence uh, that uh, the star compass is time compass. Okay, right. I believe you because you're the expert, so I, I take that all back. <laughs> <laughs> they have a star compensate, just, just not time Just not time compensate. Okay, so again, uh, if you're a dung beetle looking at the Milky Way through your low resolution optics, you might see something like this. And it's just a simple case of rotating underneath that stripe of light until you find the location or the direction you wish to travel and then keep that direction relative to that stripe. And uh, certainly work that has been done in the past on dung beetles has shown that this works extremely well. And ongoing research too, which I, doubt, I dare say Marie is going to mention in her, her lecture. And of course, one of the most uh, useful compass cues for long distance nocturnal uh, navigators in particular is, but all navigators indeed, uh, is the Earth's magnetic field. And this isn't the an all persuasive compass mechanism that even we ourselves use and harness when we use compasses for hiking. Uh, but many animals have an inbuilt magnetic compass system which allows them to use various properties of the magnetic field, some or all, depending on the species. And those cues include the angle that the uh, field lines make with the surface of the Earth as they strike or enter the surface of the Earth. So in other words, the uh, so-called inclination angle and also the polarity of the field lines. And the field lines, I should have mentioned, are sort of uh, exiting the South Pole, entering the North Pole, magnetic North Pole, and those field lines then have an angle with which they strike the Earth's surface. That angle is actually parallel to the Earth's surface along the so-called magnetic equator, um, and uh, at various other angles up to 90 degrees at the two poles. Uh, but that, that information, as well as the polarity information, can be potentially used as a directional cue, as a compass cue for navigation. In addition, in addition, another particular parameter of the Earth's magnetic field, uh, which is the um, strength of the field, how strong the field is in nanotesla, they, all of these things together can be, can be used to obtain quite a, lot, a large amount of information about uh, not only the direction you're traveling, but in restricted areas, also exactly where you are on the surface of the Earth. So the compass information, uh, strict compass information, can be obtained from the inclination and the polarity of the magnetic field lines. But in addition, if you are also able to sense the strength of the field, you might be able to have some kind of positional map of where you are um, in your general location uh, based on both the compass cues here as well as the strength. And when I talk about a map here, uh, it's very important to stress this doesn't necessarily imply some kind of topographic map like a human would use. Uh, this is sometimes misunderstood by people and even scientists, I'm, I'm afraid to think that animals have some kind of topographic map which they're able to say, I'm here, I need to go over to this village here, so I just take that road, that turn off, turn here, and, and, and somehow follow some kind of map. Where, what the representation is neurally, I don't think anybody really knows. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I don't at least have any feeling from any literature I've read that this is fully understood. But that animals have the capacity, nonetheless, of having some kind of spatial understanding of where they, are, where, they, where they are based on these various magnetic cues, I think is undisputed. I think um, several people in this room actually have shown this without doubt in birds, for instance. So many vertebrates particularly seem to have both the compass information and the sort of positional map-like information um, uh, obtainable from the magnetic field of the Earth and, and usable as, as, a, as a navigational system. 
And the reason why the strength of the field and the inclination of the field might be useful cues is that over very large areas of the Earth, they kind of form a, 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 um, a perpendicular grid. It's not really a grid, but it's a kind of a perpendicular gradient of those two features of the magnetic field. So here is a, an area of the ocean off the east coast of Africa, and here these vertical sort of lines running north-south roughly are lines of equal field strength. These are the so-called magnetic isodynamics. You see them running here, uh, more, or less, more or less north-south. And perpendicular almost, east-west running roughly, are the so-called magnetic isoclinics, and these are lines of equal inclination. And if it's possible for you, and this has been shown very beautifully by um, Ken Lohman uh, first in, in sea turtles, if you're able to um, determine your local inclination and your local field strength, you have at least the potential to find out where you are on the surface of the Earth. And most sea turtles probably don't have a kind of a GPS in that sense in their head, although Ken Lohman has referred to it as a GPS system, mostly to allow people a better pedagogical understanding of what's going on. Um, but probably if you follow gradients of inclination or gradients of field strength until you come to that combination, which you associate, for instance, in the case of a sea turtle, uh, with the beach on which you were born possibly many years earlier and you return as a female to lay your eggs on the very same beach. Yes? Sir, uh, sorry for, for the question. No, that's okay. Sorry. That's what we're here for. But uh, here we are always assuming that those processes live in two-dimensional spaces, right? We are neglecting the, the third dimension. Sorry, I couldn't, there's some noise in the roof. I couldn't quite hear okay, what sorry. you said. No, we, yeah. we are just saying that all these navigation process, processes are taking place in a two-dimensional space. We are neglecting the third one. You mean? Altitude. Uh, yeah, the altitude. Yeah, of okay. course. Yeah. So That's we, right. we need just to uh, system of two coordinates to pinpoint a particular place in the in a geographic area. Yeah, I don't think the concept of altitude has been dealt with much except in insects, but correct me if I'm wrong. No, I, I mean if you are a long distance migrant, of course, and you want to go thousands of kilometers, yeah. the the variation yeah, in height yeah. is minuscule. Yeah. So your main problem is certainly in two dimensions. Uh, whether in the pinpointing the goal phase, there can be some cases where altitude would play, so the third dimension would play a role, cannot be excluded. Okay. But at least on thousands of kilometers, oh, sure. the altitude space is very, very small. So I want to add to this that the, uh, the, the oftentimes the animals have uh, completely other cues to measure their altitude. Let's say in the sea, for example, fish can measure their depth from pressure. It's a very strong cue. It's completely different, unrelated to the magnetic uh, cues. So they have a, a different sensory uh, system that allows them to measure uh, depth. In, in fact, you know, uh, vertical dimension is very important uh, in the sea. You know, the biggest <laughs> migration actually in the world is this vertical movement by plankton, the day versus night. So the, the third dimension matters, but they use completely different cues. And the other thing that I want to say is that sometimes it really depends. For the same animal, sometimes it does matter, the third dimension, sometimes it doesn't. So let's say take <laughs> my favorite animal, the bat. So if you're navigating in a, in a cave system, you know, inside the cave, then it does matter because, you know, the cave could be 100 meter long, but also tens of meter high, and it could be, you know, complex structures that is three dimensional. So to navigate in and out, you definitely need to know your third dimension. But as Henrik said, once they go out of the cave, they need to navigate 20, 30, or 2,000 kilometers because some bat species actually migrate couple of that, two or three thousand of kilometers, then you know you can't, you navigate two thousand kilometers straight, you don't navigate two thousand kilometers up. So so then it's really kind of two and a half dimensional so, problem. So it can be also that the, the third length the, the altitude enters at a certain point. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So I think that for the same animal within the same flight, while you navigate in the cave, the third dimension <coughs> matters and you need maybe to have three place cells or whatnot. But then once you go out then the third dimension is kind of becomes much less relevant. So the same animal within minutes can switch from a situation where the third dimension matters. No, this is also, I mean, Eric mentioned this, that we should always think about these phases of navigation. It's not a constant thing. Things change as you move along. So the sensory cues change, but also maybe the neural representation as well as the change. Yeah, but it also depends on the cue, right? Because if you have cues that are more or less constant for different altitudes, like for example, the magnetic field, but then, for example, when you're talking about the pressure, that yeah. really changes yeah. for different altitudes. So, uh, in the end, I think that it's kind of a weighted sum uh, that depends on the cue and the position regarding the cue. 
and not tolerant of reliability. We know from sensory systems that they also work in the same time, I'm talking about neuroscience, and sensory systems as work showing that a kind of multi-sensory neuron often would weigh in sensory input based on their reliability. So we do some, some sort of weighted average with yeah. to give more weight to a reliable cue. So let's say, I mean, I don't know if that has been shown in this precise way, navigation system, but I bet that this must be the case. That if you have a more reliable cue, you give that a more uh, a stronger uh, um, you know, weight in, in your navigation. And the weighted average should depend on the navigation task, right? Because then it would be some way if it's a day and then different if it's night. It depends on the cues in the way. Right. Hmm? Okay. Um, <clears throat> and a number of animals have actually been shown to have a kind of a, a magnetic map based on the inclination and uh, field strength of uh, the Earth's magnetic field. Um, the reed warbler, and actually the author of this paper is sitting in the room, <laughs> uh, sea turtles, spiny lobsters and Pacific salmon uh, have all been implicated as being able to navigate using such a uh, magnetic map. So using both information about the compass and also the map sense. And I think, Henrik, you're going to talk a bit more about the division of these two things in well, your lecture. I'm or, or maybe to Nikita. mention the division, but I'm going to leave all the talking to Nikita. Excellent. So okay. I'm, going to, <laughs> I'm going to emphasize this difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. So you truly have, I mean, the, the experts in this, in this field assembled here this week. It's a, an amazing lineup of people working on navigation, I have to say. Right. Okay, the last type of um, uh, sort of global uh, cues that you can have, sensory cues, are based on various types of gradients of light in the sky. Uh, there's an intensity gradient, which is a very um, obvious one. It's always brighter in the half of the sky that contains the sun, or the moon for that matter, and always darker in the side of the, of the sky, which doesn't contain the sun or the moon. And there's a kind of a gradient of intensity. And it's well known that some animals use this as a navigational cue, actually. Uh, likewise, the spectral gradient, again, is used by some animals for navigation. The, the uh, half of the sky which contains the sun is greener in terms of spectrum than the side of the sky that doesn't contain the sun, or the moon, for that matter. The moon and the sun having almost exactly the same spectrum as a light source, actually, because the moon, the spectrum of light you have from the moon uh, is, is uh, basically that of the sun because it's reflected sunlight you see from the moon. Obviously the surface of the moon itself modifies the spectrum a little bit but it's essentially a flat reflector. Okay, so these are two other potential cues. What about local external cues? What kinds of sensory cues can animals use in the vicinity of their nest within their territory, for instance, which they use for those tasks I mentioned earlier, like homing, for instance, path integration. What, ki what kinds of sensory cues are used at that point? Obviously, all the global cues are available. I mean, even in the local habitat, global cues are available. And many of those are actually used, obviously. So this, this isn't in any way in try trying to imply that the cues I'm about to tell you replace the ones I just told you about. These are in addition, actually, for these animals. And they seem to be, you're able to sort of define these in, in two kind of spatial scales. You can uh, think about cues that are used on the fine scale. That is very, very close to the goal. For instance, very close to a food source or very close to home. Okay, there are suites of sensory cues that can be used to identify home or identify a foraging site. Then there's also kind of more a medium scale kind of geographical spatial scale, which is sort of over the size of a, a foraging area or maybe a habitat, sort of an area that's reasonably large relative to body size, but not extraordinarily large, sort of not intercontinental sort of scale, but some, an area that the animal would be reasonably familiar with most likely. So if we talk first about those kind of more fine scale sensory cues available around the nest, or, or a foraging site. And obviously some of the best known ones, and these, by, by the way, this is not an ex sort of exhaustive list. These are just the more, the more obvious ones that and people have studied in the past. Um, obviously visual landmarks around the nest are an incredibly important cue for many animals to find home. This is particularly true of uh, insects and other animals at home, like, for instance, homing pigeons, are, and I'm sure Anna will tell you about this 
in more detail as well, but visual landmarks and also olfactory landmarks. I, I think, Anna, you'll probably talk a lot about those at least, yeah. Um, but even for insects, uh, even for insects that have traditionally been thought to be guided and navigate almost wholeheartedly on the basis of, of vision, uh, even these animals have in recent years been shown to use a suite of sensory cues for navigation and homing, including olfactory ones. There's some very beautiful work from the group of Marcus Knarden on Cataglyphus, um, which uh, show that not only visual landmarks close to the nest, but even olfactory landmarks close to the nest are incredibly important for allowing cataglyphus to find home after a path integration. So in addition to path integration, to get them into the right place, they can, in addition, when they're very, very close, use both visual and olfactory landmarks to really pinpoint that final nest entrance, the place they desperately need to get to before they fry up, literally. And if you take away either the olfactory or, or the visual, leaving the other sensory cues there, their homing abilities decline dramatically, actually. Um, so neither of them in isolation allow the ants to home well. Only when both are present is maximal uh, uh, homing efficiency achieved. So that's a very strong indication, again, for what I said earlier, that sensory cues are rarely, if ever, used in isolation. There's always a suite of cues which are used for navigational tasks. And this is extre extremely true um, for this very fine scale spatial uh, orientation that you see here. Yeah. I want to add to this. Yeah. There is also, yeah, so it really depends on the animal. Some yeah. animals, for example, use uh, acoustic. Yes, landmarks. absolutely. So yeah. Bats, for example, are, uh, uh, um, were shown to be able to identify objects. You know, incomplete objects, you don't have a visual cue, but different trees, for example, give different kinds of, of uh, signatures of echoes, so they can identify that tree versus the other tree has a landmark. They use that, you know, turn at uh, that tree rise and things like that as a plan of navigation. Some, and, and some bats actually see pretty well as well. So we use both uh, visual landmarks and acoustic landmarks. So basically, an animal has, like I said, we use whatever they can do. The bats are good at acoustics, so they use acoustic. Yeah, absolutely. And as I say, the, what I'm saying now, just for the sake of brevity, is by, by no means an exhaustive list of cues. Uh, and I have to also confess that I'm a bit insect biased, so I, I apologise for that immediately as well. Uh, but as I say, we'll hear the whole breadth of the animal kingdom in this course anyway, so I'm not particularly worried about that. Okay, so when you're using landmarks to navigate, obviously what you're trying to do is understand the arrangement of landmarks and where your nest is relative to those and change your orientation, your, your heading direction here uh, in order to steer towards your goal, which is your nest entrance, for instance, um, according to the, your memory, your sort of uh, snapshot memory, as it's often referred to, that's present in your memory of your, in your brain and you're always trying to match your visual image of the world with that remembered snap, snapshot in order to find exactly where to fly or to walk to find your way home. So these are very, very important cues in homing at the very, at, at close range to the, to the nest. Uh, classic examples of, uh, again, I'm a bit insect biased, I apologise, but visual, visual landmarks for, for instance, honeybees are incredibly important. And what honeybees are, have been known to do and all bees, it turns out, and we work on nocturnal bees, I'll talk about those later, but even in a dark rainforest at night, these, uh, these visual landmarks are incredibly important for nocturnal bees to find their way home to their nest in a rainforest. And these bees, uh, bees and other insects too, perform what is referred to as an orientation flight when they leave the nest, especially if they're rather green, novice insects that are only recently emerged. They'll fly out of the nest, turn around in midair, face the nest and then begin to fly in slow arcs around, away from the nest, moving backwards. And while they do that, they're understanding the three-dimensional arrangement of landmarks around the nest in order to be able to remember that arrangement as a kind of snapshot memory so that when they return, they're able to find exactly where the nest entrance is. And very, very many very beautiful and very elegant experiments have been done over many decades where uh, experimenters have allowed animals to do these orientation behaviours, um, learn the arrangement of landmarks around the nest and then fly away to go foraging and while they're away the evil experimenter then manipulates the landmarks and makes certain predictions about where they will return and indeed they return exactly where predicted, showing very clearly that the animals are using visual landmarks to find their way back. But again, we'll hear about that more in the course. 
Then in the medium scale, um, sort of within the general habitat of where the animal finds itself most of the time, there are different types of uh, uh, sort of sensory landmarks available, if you like, uh, in this larger geographical area. And you can define four different kinds of cues. Beaconing cues, uh, there's also cues used in route following, other cues used in path integration, and also finally, the last sort of stage, which is a much, probably one of the most controversial areas of navigation research today, the use of so-called cognitive maps in navigation and the kinds of cues which are used there. And that's uh, what will occupy me for the remaining time. And, uh, and that will be the brief introduction to sensory cues done. So what do I mean by beaconing? Well, that generally um, refers to the use of some kind of sensory cue that you sort of head towards. Uh, there are many different kinds of these. This could be navigation to a visual object, like a mountaintop on the horizon that you just head towards. And we ourselves do this all the time when we're out bushwalking uh, or walking somewhere. You often want to go in a particular direction. You work out what that direction is. You find something on the horizon that looks basically in that direction. You just head for it. Okay, it's a very common thing that we do. Uh, but animals use it too. So the greatest spear-nosed bat, for instance, is known to use mountaintops in, I think, Trinidad from memory to find its way back to the roost. Yeah. Um, and that's a, a clear visual beacon. But they're by far not alone in doing this. It's a very common kind of strategy for finding your way home. There's also kind of olfactory beaconing. So moths, for instance, are always on the lookout. Male moths are on the lookout for female moths that are producing pheromone. And the, the female provides this type of plume of pheromone that's wafting out into the air. And the male moth will follow this plume to its source and find the female. So this is a kind of a, an olfactory beacon. Uh, so albatrosses that fly over large distances in the ocean looking for um, the smell of uh, dead fish on the surface of the sea, they also home in like a beacon on this olfactory stimulus that could be located many hundreds of kilometres from where they currently are, but with a very sensitive olfactory system, uh, they have the possibility of finding this, these food sources. There's also sounds which are available. Um, Nakam reminded me this morning that, that there are certain species of bats that actually um, home, I think they home on the basis of the sounds of frogs in their in immediate habitat. Uh, they use this as a kind of a, an auditory beacon, if you like, to find their way home. Yeah. So that's one, one type of uh, navigational strategy, beaconing, and the kinds of cues that you could use to perform that particular task. Root following is also an interesting thing that you see in many animals. We're classic root followers. I mean, when you find your way from home to work, uh, you're effectively root following. I mean, you go to the, to the 7-Eleven on that corner and turn left, and then you go two blocks and turn right at the McDonald's and uh, walk a kilometre, go past that tree, go past that school, go past the Department of Mathematics, and then you get to the biology department. Okay, that's the kind of thing we do as well. And many other animals do the same. Uh, even... Uh, Animals like ants, for instance, are a classic example of this. Uh, this is an example of an ant, Meloferus, um, which is found in uh, central Australia. And they live in an environment which is sort of dominated by tufts of grass. So they have to find their way around in a quite complicated 3D environment from their nest to a food source and back again. And very nice experiments done uh, in the group of Rudy Gavina have shown that if you study the paths between a, a, a nest here in this case, and a feeder, and these little lumps around here are where tufts of grass and other small bushes and obstacles are. If you study the tracks of those ants, you see them rather repeatedly following exactly the same route, uh, and that if you pick an ant up here at the nest and drop it in the middle of the route, so it's just returned to the nest with food that's about to go in, you pick it up and put it back in the middle of that track again, which is several metres away, and let it then return, it follows this very predictable path back to the nest that it's done probably countless times. Again, in, in this particular case, if you pick up ants here and put them in the middle of the track, they too will follow, find their way back along a predictable path. And these, this route following relies on specific landmarks that the animal has picked up, visual, olfactory possibly, that they remember, and they create a kind of a memorized sequence of snapshots at each location along the route that they sort of play back almost, if you like, in their head as they return home. And as long as the sensory 
impression of the world that they're actually experiencing matches the one that's stored in their head at that moment in time, then they know they're on track and on course and that their route following is going in the right way. And that is, show, that is proven by these experiments where you can basically displace an ant from any one location on its foraging route to any other location and it will find its way back. Yeah? Sorry, uh, but when you displace the, the hand from the nest to the middle point there, yeah. is it loaded with the food or is it just, I mean, because the, the goal for a particular ant would be like uh, reflecting the internal state. So yeah. if I'm loaded with food, I want to go to the nest, otherwise I go looking for food. Sure, sure, yeah. I, to be honest, I don't recall the exact details of that aspect of the experiment, but I think they went back with food. Yeah, they have food items. That was what I thought too. Thanks, Pauline. Yeah. Okay, and this kind of, um, this has been, this idea of sort of like mental snapshots, if you like, and these snapshots that have been studied mostly are visual, but this doesn't only hold for visual information. Obviously, it's a sensory snapshot, so you remember a particular odour at a particular location is associated with a particular <coughs> visual scene. You remember all of that um, in your head, and insects are particularly good at doing this. So between the foraging site and the nest, they're able to remember this sequence, if you like, of sensory snapshots, which they then are able to match to on their way home. And on their way out as well, for that matter. Um, and various types of insects have been studied in detail. Another example are these nocturnal bull ants from Australia that rely on a panorama of trees around the nest entrance to find their correct route to follow uh, away from the nest and to find their way back to the nest after looking for food. And experiments have been done where people have chopped down dead trees in this panorama, not, alive, not living trees but dead ones, and actually disrupted this panorama and discovered that the navigational system of the ants is very disrupted when you do that, for a while at least until they get their bearings again and recalculate after a couple of nights. Then they're able to find their way back to the nest again, but initially at least it causes a great deal of trouble. So this kind of uh, sort of panorama, if you like, based snapshot matching is, 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 a, is a basis of navigation in many different kinds of animals. It's been particularly well studied in insects. Um, and again, the mode of navigation is basically if you've got a particular goal, then you're always continuously attempting to match that kind of stored snapshot, if you like, of the sensory world in your brain with the actual world you're experiencing at any given time and making sure that you try and attempt to match those two things in order to find the new direction that you need to go at that moment in time. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, I think the, the chief, I mean, obviously there's shades, these are shades of grey, these things. I mean, it's no actual clear, sharp distinction. The difference, I think, the main difference is that beaconing involves a single target sensory cue that you're heading towards all the time. It's always omnipresent. It's visible or detectable. I won't say visible. It's detectable over uh, a great distance and it's always, um, uh, it's always there. But in the case of route following like this, uh, you don't necessarily, for instance, see the, the sensory cues that are close to the nest when you're far away. Uh, you don't detect those cues when you're far away. So you basically have to follow this kind of railway track, if you like, of, of remembered snapshots to find your way back. I think that would be the chief difference. Yeah, I think that uh, the Ken Cheng and others have done these uh, experiments on man manipulations where you can uh, kind of create a cardboard version, circular version of the panorama, mm -hmm. and then you can rotate it, but it will be difficult to do in that hand to a larger distance, but then the, the ant would, well, I don't think of this species, but I don't remember which species it was, but the ant will rotate with it, but they seem not to go to, you know, particularly big tree, they can go something, you know, in between trees, it's just something that's, you know, a global panorama gives them some general direction, but it's not a particular land. No. It's kind of a, a bit of a definition issue of what you mean by beacon, but yeah, I think in the case of the nocturnal um, bull ants, they require the entire panorama. And if you disrupt a piece of it, which in percent terms could be just a small percentage of the total visual panorama in this case, it still has quite a dramatic effect on their navigational abilities, at least temporarily. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I find if you think of that as uh, comparing your snapshot taken from the environment to the thing that you're act actually saying, like trying to compute the this match between that, I find it's a bit difficult to transfer that information into your 
steering behavior because like if you just if you think of it as a pixel-wise arrangement, mm -hmm. a slight mismatch or like a movement would cause like a huge mismatch. And how do you like um, transfer that into a smooth maybe steering or some translational movement? I find it. I think the point is that there's never going to be a 100% match possibly for various reasons. Something could happen on the way out on a foraging trip between be when you come there and get back again. A tree might fall down, something might blow over, who knows. But I think the point of all of these, this matching uh, in inverted commas is that you try and get the best match and the best match will give you the right direction. So it's fairly robust, I think that's the point. But I, I guess Stanley will talk a lot more about this in his lecture because that aspect of how this type of matching um, is turned into steering uh, is very much at the heart of the work that, st that Stanley does. Yeah, but do you like simulate it in your head or are you actually trying to take different actions to like minimize? That's an extremely good question. Um, that would require one to know what, what it's like to be inside the head of an insect if we're talking about an ant in this case. And I can't really answer that question, although uh, Stanley may have a bit more intuitive feeling for it than I do. <laughs> yes, Henry. Comment. I mean, we of course don't know all this, okay? So, but I mean, you could maybe imagine that the animal has some kind of global uh, sense of direction, like, and then, you know, relative to body axis, so that they may not have to micro compute, like you think. You're, you're thinking like a computer scientist, now I have to micro compute every little turn I'm doing. Maybe that's not what they are doing, because if they have a general sense of direction, now they turn because they need to go around a little bush or something like that, it, it may not necessarily now calculate all those pixels at that moment, because, okay, the task is now to go around the bush, who knows? I mean, or it may calculate it all the time, we don't know. So, so I, I think you could make a simpler algorithm than what you were thinking of. I think I was also adding to this, uh, uh, Jochen Seil in, uh, in Australia, <laughs> But if you open Zal in Australia, did some, did some beautiful works. Uh, really, it did some of the most detailed studies of navigation where he had, let's say, uh, wasps or other insects. But I think he, with the wasps, it was particularly beautiful. So he had wasps navigating through the nest, and he measured with this laser scanner the entire 3D structure of like, a patch of a bush. So imagine, like, I don't remember the size, but like 100 or 100 meters, every little twig has been measured. So you know the 3D position of, of every twig and it measures the 3D flights of these, um, of these uh, uh, wasps. And you're right that the problem is that this is a discontinuous thing, right? Because initially you have the panorama changing smoothly, but then as you go between two bushes, suddenly you have another piece of panorama that's recruited so far. So you have this transition. And what he showed, and I don't know how general, uh, general it is, but I remember hearing him give lectures with some examples that that the wasps were indeed doing this discontinuous thing. It's exactly the moment where the panorama changed also that the wasp changed direction. So you can, you can find these matches between this discontinuity in the sensory information and the behavior of the animal. But I don't know how generic it is. Yeah, I wanted to add something as well uh, that is uh, based on modeling work. And uh, Barbara Webb from Ember, she's, she's um, done some very nice modeling that showed that you can take that to a really um, like an extreme almost. So you take like all the snapshots Nan actually has taken on the route outwards and calculate the average. And that is enough to guide you back home, just comparing it actually to the average based on a very low resolution image. Even. So you have maybe 200 pixels or so. And so that very crude information average would still be enough to guide you back home in a more or less reliable way, as long as you don't deviate too much from your uh, course. And so that's it. So you don't need a very kind of high density of information to do that behavior. The thing is, this question is very important because it also comes to the heart of some of the arguments about the neural side of things, the cognitive map, etc. Because the cognitive map has this kind of assumption that you have a continuous representation of the entire environment over a lot of distances. And the problem is that indeed the sensor information tends to be to be discontinuous, to be jumpy, and indeed some of the arguments, you know, have. I had the, uh, the privilege to spend a, a week some years ago in this uh, navigation course in, in Australia. I was kind of the only mammalian person with all the insect people. And the insect people, except with a couple of, of um, um, 
with outliers, they're really the most anti-cognitive math people out there. So it was like, I, I was <laughs> left standing after this one week. <laughs> it's really, uh, I was proud of myself. But, uh, you know, they, they basically claim this, that, you could, that the information is discontinuous, so why, why talk about math? Why not talk about local? And indeed, maybe it is the case. We don't know yet. I think it should, should be studied also at the neural level. Maybe you have local cognitive math that's continuous, <coughs> that if you think of a, of a city, if you have a map of, of a particular square, then another square, and in between you have uh, streets. So there are theories out there, especially in human uh, navigation, that you have uh, local maps maybe connected by, by graphs, by vectors. So this uh, also the cognitive graph-like ideas. So I think these kinds of questions very much were relevant for the behavior side of navigation, but also on the on the neural side. And I think the general uh, situation is that we don't have good answers on either one of them. Huh? Yeah, I have a question related to that. Um, so I was wondering what um, experimental evidence exists that um, if, an, if an animal uses snapshots that they are somehow stored with information about the order. So mm. because as far as I know in the art and literature is mostly I think it's that there's some evidence that basically collections of snapshots, whether then they're averaged or not, are connected to uh, like context, for example, going to Frida or going back to the group, but <coughs> as far as I know, I don't know how much evidence there is that there is order or positional information connected to anything, which, like, I don't know if there is, I mean, because as a human navigating, <laughs> following a strategy, I do feel like there is something like that, right, because people, like, this is an anecdotal, but you're like, if you go back to a certain st like point, then you kind of remember what you needed to do from there, but sometimes maybe even encountering the same scene without the history doesn't work as well, but I don't know any Experimental evidence in animals. Is it possible that, I mean, if you said that I mean, they use average uh, so images, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you average the first image now and then the tenth after uh, ten seconds or vice versa? Yeah, but if you wanted to kind of have something that is more like a map, having the order would be useful, right? Because then you get to something like a graph. If you have like position or temporal information, then maybe you could connect different routes that I don't think work so well for the averaging strategy. So I think maybe there's, I mean, I don't know if any evidence in, in insects for that, but I mean, you would think that someone, <laughs> some other animals might do this. I don't know if there's any evidence no. for it, but maybe you don't need order. Um, maybe you're just selecting like the best match at any given moment in time. But what you could imagine is, so because you can assume that you always have a park in the ground running in the background, and then you could associate the vector states with snapshots, and that gives you a whole another range of uh, possibilities. And that could involve like storing an order, because if your vector is shorter, you're retrieving probably a specific image. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's only speculative. There's no data for that. But it that seems like in VR, you could try something like that. Right? You can scramble yeah. the visual feedback, basically. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. But doesn't the Lima experiment Eric just shows suggest that that <coughs> is not the case? Because there they move them with zero vector or full vector yeah. to middle way, and they seem to immediately follow the... It depends the a lot on the species. It depends on if you live in a, a dense environment or not. So that was all done with the cataclyphus, which is can live in a completely impoverished environment with no land loss whatsoever except for olfaction. And so there the emphasis on the path integration is a lot more. And, but then if you the other experiment with the root, there you take not so much emphasis on the path integrator, but it's always shifting, it's always kind of relative, actually, what gives you the best, least noisy um, readout. Yeah, so it's the ecological situation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I better get going because we're nearly running out of time, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, we were talking about root following, now we're talking about path integration. We're getting out, we're nearly finished. <laughs> Uh, I don't have to say that, mention this again, I, did, I mentioned this earlier um, about path integration, but the point I want to make at this point when we're talking about the actual sensory cues being used for this rather remarkable task is that it requires some kind of compass and some kind of odometer because the, the point is that every single point uh, along this outbound journey, the ant is calculating more or less the present location from the past trajectory in order to work out at the point where they find food exactly in what direction and over what distance they need to, ra to travel in order to find home. And the compass, it turns out, over many decades of research is this uh, polarised light 
um, in the sky that I mentioned earlier. That's the compass cue. When it comes to the odometer, on the other hand, it turns out to rely on this third class of cues, and this is what I want to end with. And that odometer seems to rely on internal or idiothetic cues. In the, and this def, def, exactly what type of cue depends on your load, mode of locomotion, it turns out. Because if you're a flying animal, then it turns out you use something called optic flow. And I don't know if you know exactly what optic flow is, all of you, but basically if I walk ahead like this, then the whole world with all of you in it is moving backwards relative to me. So you are creating a flow of uh, visual information on my retina, uh, indicating to me that the flow of the world is going backwards, which my brain then interprets as me going forwards. Okay? If I move backwards like this, then everything sort of contracts and you're moving in the opposite direction to me again. And this is referred to as translational optic flow. So when things at the side are moving backwards or forwards relative to me, this is referred to as translational optic flow, which is shown diagrammatically here. Thanks again, Stanley, for these nice pictures. Uh, if instead I were, were to rotate like this, then the whole world would rotate in the opposite direction, okay? And that's referred to as rotational optic flow. Well, it turns out um, over many decades, actually, of research on, by, from very, various different uh, researchers, Esh, Srinivasa, and Ronaka, to name just a few, actually, have found that bees, uh, flying animals like bees, are able to compute the length of this home vector uh, in this path integration process by measuring the amount of optic flow they experience on the outbound journey. So in other words, if they fly only a short distance before they find the foraging site, they'll have encountered only a little bit of optic flow. So as they're flying along, the world is moving around relative to them. They're measuring the extent of that optic flow movement. And if it's only a, a small amount of optic flow, then that would indicate most likely that the length of the home vector that they're calculating is also reasonably short. But if it's a much greater amount of optic flow, uh, then the return vector will be longer. And indeed, these researchers and others have been able to manipulate this very predictable feature of the world and expose animals to much more optic flow than they normally would experience in the wild and find indeed that they overshoot the position of home by a very large margin uh, because they believe the home vector is longer than it actually is by those manipulations. So it's beautifully, very elegant experiments which have been done on this. If you are instead a walking animal like Cataglyphus, doing path integration. It turns out that the odometer for these animals is based on uh, the idiot, uh, being able to calculate the length and number of steps taken during the outbound journey. Okay, so you count your steps. Basically, you could, in the simplest case, I could work out how far it is to the, to the, the water over there just by simply counting the number of steps and knowing in advance how long each one of my steps actually is and by multiplying the length of each stride by the number of strides, I get the length of the vector. Okay, it's not that simple for a path integrating animal, obviously, because they're making a very tortuous outbound route. But nonetheless, this turns out to be the basis of their odometer. And again, extremely elegant experiments from the lab of Rudy Gavainer have shown that if you experimentally manipulate ants that have been foraging and actually either add legs or remove legs by a set amount, so in other words, you put stilts on um, ants and actually increase their stride length by 30%. Or you do the opposite and you, you cut off parts of their legs and create little stumps so that you reduce their stride length by 30%. Uh, and then you have controls, obviously, where you do nothing at all to the ants. It turns out that experiments like this have shown that the number of actual strides is an important indicator for the ants of how far they've traveled in their outbound journey because it turns out that the ants with stilts overshoot the home location by about 30%, exactly as predicted, uh, whereas the ants with stumps undershoot by about the same amount. So these are very powerful experiments showing that, in fact, it's these internal idiothetic cues of being able to count the number of steps and knowing already in advance how long each of your own steps actually is that is used to, to um, work out the distance home. So that the compass is the polarised light pattern uh, giving you the direction and the number and length of the strides gives you the length of the home vector. And again, the same kind of ideas here with navigation with path integration. You're continuously updating your home vector length and direction by reading compass cues and counting your steps uh, and thereby adjusting finally, you, when you find food eventually, you know then which 
direction to travel and over what length in order to find your nest. So finally, and the very last thing I want to talk about now is probably the most controversial area of navigation research as already suggested by Nakam with his brief interactions with people working on insects who are absolutely not all of them at least positive towards the concept, at least in insects. Um, and this is relying on some kind of a mental map of your environment, a sensory mental map of your environment that allows you to find your way home without any need to pass by a specific landmark or find a specific location in order to be able to go to the next landmark to find your way home. So this is very different to route following, actually. This is dumping you anywhere and you find your way home. And again, very important to note, this, having some kind of map like this does not imply some kind of internal spatial representation equivalent to a topographic map that you would have as a human being. There is no necessity that it should be that way. It might be that way, but there's no proof one way or the other that it is that way. Just important to bear that in mind. And I think a lot of the conflicts that you encounter in the literature have to do with this statement, actually, unfortunately. Um, just a kind of an example of uh, naive birds, or at least initially naive birds, that um, were located in a certain location. This is just outside Oxford. These show the tracks of pigeons, homing pigeons, which are released from their, which have been forcibly transported uh, five kilometres away from their home site. The home is this little open circle. Each one of these panels corresponds to an individual bird, so this is four birds in total. Um, and in this study, the birds were translated away by five kilometres to the same location 24 times. And on this plot for each bird, you see the first four flights and the last four flights of those 24 flights. Uh, and the first four flights are shown in blue and the, the last in red. And uh, the, the sort of result here shows quite dramatically, I think, that these birds really have no idea where, where they are at all at the beginning. And it takes them a long time and a very long track, actually, to find their way home. But after 24 flights, they've somehow sort of learnt the kind of world that they live in. They don't all follow exactly the same tracks home, that's important. But whatever track they work out um, seems to uh, allow them to get back very efficiently, ultimately, after they've learnt this sort of world that they live in. Now, whether or not actually this is a cognitive map is hard to say, but it's a kind of an indication that at least on a large scale, uh, an animal like a homing pigeon is, is in the end able to learn something about this world it lives in in order to find its way home. Uh, I don't know if they followed this up by taking the same birds and dropping them in other locations, but, but um, at least on, on this single displacement they've been able to, to actually learn this route. But probably more impressive are Nakam's bats, actually. Um, and these bats, as I'm sure Nakam will go into detail with you, they live in uh, um, caves in one location, and in this particular diagram at least, the, the bats that they tracked were looking for a tree 15 kilometres away that bore fruit. These are fruit bats. Uh, and they make these extraordinarily straight beeline sort of flight paths between home and the foraging site. Um, and what's very interesting about these bats is if you, if you take one of these bats and take them away in any location you like from the cave, up to 100 kilometres away, is that correct? No, come here. And then release them. They go in an exact beeline back to where their nest is. So no searching, no getting lost first and then finding their way, directly there. Either to the cave or to the tree. Or to the tree, the okay. Oh, right, okay, right. Um, but that's actually even more impressive. I didn't realise that. Okay. Um, and that sort of implies that they've got some kind of cognitive map of their environment, that they're able to do that. Because um, if they required, for instance, to follow a, a, a set route, then they would probably spend a lot of time searching in an almost random manner before they found some kind of landmark, sensory landmark of some kind, whether it be visual or olfactory or, or some other landmark, that they would hit and recognise and say, aha, here's the track, and then start following it. But they, the fact that they, they, they move directly in a straight line from nowhere, no matter where you displace them, uh, if I've understood correctly, uh, implies the likelihood, at least, of some kind of cognitive map of their sensory environment. Uh, so there's very interesting animals indeed. Um, but I've got a question. Mm. Yeah, you know, go back again. Uh, did you ever blind those bats to see what, or what kind of sensory feedback they need actually from the environment? Uh, uh, they completely internal. Yeah, we haven't. Uh, my uh, former colleague of Yosu has tried to do experiments of potentially putting prisons, so not blinding mm -hmm. them, but to rotate the visual world by 15. Uh, 
uh, degrees and, uh, um, you know, may, there were some effects there, but uh, no, not conclusive, but maybe, and Matilde is always kind of waving at us to <laughs> keep track of the time, but I'll just mention that um, I think that the reason why, why cognitive maps is okay, so I yeah, sure. there are a couple mm. of reasons why cognitive maps are kind of controversial, people argue about them, and it's really, I think, the crux of the problem is it's really very difficult to prove, or maybe impossible, because at the, you know, for two reasons. One is that um, kind of pure map means that, you know, I can uh, uh, release an animal in an infinite number of places, and it can navigate to an infinite number, infinite number of goals at will. This is like the most flexible, absolutely arbitrary map. But this is an impossible experiment. We cannot really sample an infinite number of places that will navigate. So in these bad experiments, this is, yeah, I think, one of the furthest experiments you can go in this direction, which is we release them in three different locations and they went to two different goals, either the tree or the, uh, or the, the cave. So that's pretty good, you'd say. But it's, you know, three and two is, is not infinity. So the the, you know, the anti cognitive map people say, well, it's kind of local graphs and all. I mean, you can always argue that I think it's an impossible experiment, really, to prove a map in the strict sense. And the other thing is the issue of what what Eric said several times about is it a Euclidean map as uh, as we have, right? And so you know there is a huge parallel field that we unfortunately won't have much represented in the course except uh, Thomas Wolvers. I'll hope he will make it because he's sick, but. Uh, about of human navigation. So there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of or more papers on human navigation. There are people who have looked at these issues of uh, uh, because you can have animal, uh, humans navigating either real reality, real environments, or virtual environments, create all sorts of, of uh, wormholes and distort geometries. There are all sorts of stuff that you can do. People have done hundreds of experiments. And, um, and the argument there is that we, the problem is that we have biases, right? We don't you know, if you have an, a student navigate through a virtual campus, uh, you and then you'd ask, okay, point now to where the church is or where your department of mathematics, you'd have systematic biases. But these, and then people start to argue, is it with the bias? I mean, it's not precisely Euclidean. If it was precisely Euclidean, you would always know precisely where you are. But then the, these biases are often very small, you know, uh, four degrees or seven degrees or 10 degrees. So to me, at least, you know, if, uh, if you can navigate with only 10 degrees by it. That's pretty insanely impressive, you know. It's not precisely Euclidean, it's almost Euclidean. But then people argue whether it's convincing enough or not. So this Euclidean issue is the other kind of main reason for, for big, big arguments. It's a kind of the short version of the, the two reasons for the arguments about maps. Okay, I'm nearly, nearly finished like this. like two slides to go, so I'll be very quick now. <laughs> so yeah, we can talk about cognitive maps until the cows come home, and I'm sure we will, um, before this course is open, over. Uh, one other kind of map, that's basically sort of both mostly visual probably, but some people have talked about the concept of olfactory maps, and I'm sure Anna is going to talk more about that or tell us maybe more about that, or dismiss it even, I'm not sure, but this is uh, sort of an open area of discussion really, whether this is possible. There are people who have actually that got no, have nothing to do with um, sensory biology at all, that have made maps of cities based on smells. This is the, the smell map of Am Amsterdam. But whether animals can actually use such information is another, another issue. Um, obviously, Amsterdam is a smelly place, but I guess uh, lots of other places are too. <laughs> some, <laughs> some areas look more intensely smelly than others. But whether animals can use this kind of information, who knows? They possibly can. But whether they can make a cognitive, cognitive map out of it, yeah, another matter altogether. Can we not think? I think, uh, yeah, so basically existence of cognitive maps in animals, particularly in invertebrates, is still a highly controversial area, uh, as we've all sort of realised now, I think. <coughs> so, conclusions, and then I'm finishing. Um, I think what I wanted to try and say, this was, as I say, a very shallow talk in many ways, and I apologise profusely to everybody who's been offended that their particular system hasn't been talked about at all, or even um, deeply, uh, just lack of time, as we've all now realised. Uh, but basically the main sort of conclusions, are the take-home messages, if you like, that I'm hoping you'll take from the lecture is that navigational sensory cues can be globally available, um, they can be specific to the local environment of the animal, or they can be internal. Um, during navigation. All of these cues are present and usable. The other thing that I want you to take away is that sensory cues are used for all scales of navigation from the fine scale around the nest to the medium scale of the normal habitat range to the continental scale during long distance migration. 
And finally, sensory cues are not mutually exclusive and which combination of sensory cues or, or navigational strategies are used may depend on the environmental situation at any given time or on the current phase of a journey. A very important point. And the fact is evolution has equipped animals with sensors, all sensors to do the job that those animals need to do with the greatest likelihood of survival. And moving from Northern Europe to Africa as a nocturnally migrating bird is not trivial. So you don't rely on a single sense for that, never, ever, ever. And not surprisingly, they don't. Um, so that's all I want to say. Thank you very much.